I'm here to talk about um, a branch of economics called social choice theory. So social choice theory is essentially the, sub the study of how individual preferences are collected into group decision making. So like voting is a prime example of that. So why do we care about social choice theory in baseball? It's, well, because baseball has such intricate statistics, uh, sabermetrics, lots of in-game player analysis, but it's also a sport with a really rich history in these superlative awards. MVP, Cy Young Award, Rookie of the Year, we really like having one person we can look at and say they were the best this year. So anytime you go into voting, you kind of go into uh, social choice theory. So here today I am here to talk about uh, the MVP voting. I'll discuss a paper that has inspired my work. Um, so every November, the Baseball Writers Association of America announces an MVP, one for the American League, one for the National League. Um, and it's voted on by two sports writers from each city with an American League and National League team. So there are usually about 30 voters uh, each year. It changes over the years as teams move from one league to the other. Um, and the way it works is each voter gets a ballot and they get to rank their top 10 players. Any players are valid. And then after all the votes, all the ballots are collected and they apply this point scheme. So if you, get, if you appear on a person's ballot in 10th place, you get one point. Ninth place, you get two points. So, and they add it up, and whoever gets the most points is named MVP. So there's a big question is what determines value? And we could devote this, the rest of this conference to discussing what criteria should be determined uh, when we're looking at MVPs. But here's what, this is the entirety of the instructions that the Baseball Writers Association of America gives to voters. So in just defining value, they tell people to look at value. Uh, strength of offense, defense, number of games. There's sort of this miscongeniality award for general character and disposition. Um, anybody's eligible. And again, that's just really complicated. How do you compare a pitcher to a designated hitter? Things like that. And they also, interestingly, point out how important each vote is. So they claim that a 10th place vote can sway the election. And indeed, that is true based on uh, past awards. So I'm here to talk about if we put aside all the questions of what is value, and we just looked at how people rank. So all these voters, they think about it, they debate, they discuss, and then they submit their ballots. And what if we just looked at the ballots and how they rank people, and what if the point scheme mattered? So this a method of voting where you rank top 10 and then aggregate, this is called the board account. And it's been around, it's, it's been around for hundreds of years, but it was first formalized in 1781. And it's good because it's better than just picking one person. So if you just let everybody pick one person, there would probably be like two or three names if you're on the ballot in a given year. But this way, we let people acknowledge 10 good players. Uh, it also rewards players who are like solid fourth place players, for example. Like nobody thinks they're the actual best in the league, but everybody would agree they're one of the best. So it lets them be acknowledged rather than if we just said, who's your favorite player? Uh, there are some downsides to the board account. So it can be manipulated. So for example, in 2019, Mike Trout won the MVP for the AL. But what if one voter was like, Mike Trout's won it twice already. We should let Alex Bregman have it this time. So this voter could just completely leave out Mike Trout. Even if, for example, he thinks Mike Trout is the second best in the league, he could just leave him off the ballot and try to tank Mike Trout. So it's very manipulative, especially if there's a voter with other intentions. Um, and then there's also a, another iffy property. So let's say Mike Trout is barely beating Bregman and by just like one or two points. And this voter is like, actually, I think I want to change my mind. Instead of putting Bregman in seventh place, I want to put him in fifth place, even though he has Trout first place. Then the way other players are compared to each other can result in a difference in how the first person is ranked, even if they, that person is worse than the first place player. And then the biggest uh, feature of the board account, and the one that I'm here to discuss today, is uh, that it's highly dependent on the point scheme used. So if we go back to this table here that I kind of glossed over, we see a pretty normal point scheme. Tenth place gets two points, ninth gets, excuse me, tenth gets one point, ninth gets two, all the way up, third, eight, second, ninth. But then there's a huge jump from second place to first place. We go from nine points to 14 points. So this highly values a first place vote. And so why would they do this? 
in one way, it kind of goes back to this being a superlative award. We want the big names. We want the best player. So if these voters are thinking this is number one, then it kind of makes sense to give them a high premium so we get the big names. We don't want someone with a lot of like third place votes to really come above the others. At least that's for a major award like this. It's also uh, actually a fairly smart decision on their, uh, the designer's part because as we'll see later, it's, if you do try to tank a player by leaving them off, then this kind of counteracts it. So, but we'll discuss that more in a little bit. So, in 1992, Jean-Pierre Benoit uh, published this paper in an economics journal, actually. Uh, and he looked at all MVP voting from 1943, when it began, through 1989. And he said, instead of this 14, 9, 8, 7, 6, he, what if we applied a different point scheme? We took away that big gap, or we made different gaps in other places. And he realized that in all 86 cases, the order of the MVP finalists would have changed. And in 24 elections, the person that we named MVP would not have been named MVP under a different system. So most of the time, a second place player would have risen to the first if we got rid of that gap. Uh, in five cases, the third place player could have actually become the first place MVP. And in one case, he even found that a fourth place player can move up. Uh, another interesting finding from his paper was that from 43 to 89, the number of times that we can name a different MVP decreased. And he hypothesized this was because uh, there's been a lot more media coverage of baseball from 43 to 89. And we'll also discuss that later. So my analysis, he published this paper in 1990. And so I pick up where he left off. So for, I looked at all 58 MVP AL and NL elections from 1990 to 2018. And I also applied different point schemes to see if his findings of reversal uh, still apply today. So crucially, I assumed that the uh, voter, the ballots are honest. So is that reasonable? It's probably not because, uh, they, again, they could tank. These might not actually be who they want. If they're strategic voters under a different system, they might have strategically tried to knock somebody out. But for the sake of example, this is perfectly reasonable because we're trying to see how ballots the same, preferences the same, how do point schemes affect things. So I looked at 10 different point schemes. So we have the first column, uh, the official scheme. The second column is sort of the obvious scheme, where if we took away the, four, the five point gap, so it just goes 10, 9, 8, 7. Uh, scheme B here is if, what if they could only pick one person, only first place mattered. Uh, scheme C, D, and E are what if we kept the premium between first and second, because in some ways that does make sense, but we just made it smaller. So now there's only, a, in scheme C, a four point gap, D, a three point gap, E, a two point gap. Um, schemes F and G, we say, okay, well, if first place matters this much, then second place also probably matters quite a bit. So what if we kept a gap between first and third, but we also made a bigger gap between second and third. And so we have 13, 11, 9 in scheme F and 13, 12, 8. So in scheme G, we value first and second both very highly, and then there's a gap. In the schemes H, I, and J, these are three schemes that uh, Benoit originally uh, came up with. These are ones that produced really big shifts in his original analysis. So I applied them again to see how they would affect uh, more recent races. So these are the schemes. This is what the ballot breakdown looks like. So uh, 28 voters ranked their top 10, submitted it to the Baseball Writers Association of America, and then they, these are the results. So thankfully, the Baseball Writers Association of America is very transparent uh, about their process. They release the breakdowns, and in past years, they even release the individual ballots so you can look up who the voters voted for. So that was incredibly useful for my analysis. So for example, in 2006, Justin Morneau was named the MVP, and he received 15 first place votes, followed by Derek Jeter, who received 12. <clears throat> so we see in, in the original scheme, Morneau wins by quite a bit, by 14 points. But if we, so if we look at scheme G, if they had used this pre other scheme, which was, this was the uh, word, there's 13 for first place, 12 for second, and then nine for third, in Scheme G, Derek Jeter would have been named the MVP under a perfectly reasonable system. Uh, so this is an example of an MVP reversal. So it also affects frequently in every single election, uh, even if first and second aren't affected as they are in this one. Um, for example, other 
uh, places do matter. And to these individuals, where they're ranked on here does matter. So for example, uh, under schemes H, I, and J, Maurer and Santana, they swap. They kind of go back and forth. So from A through G, Maurer is indeed the winner. But in H, I, and J, Santana becomes the winner. Um, so also scheme J is interesting. This would be, what if we only rank the top five? So if we did, then Guerrero, who's in ninth, would not even be an MVP finalist. And ranking five is actually uh, how the Cy Young Award is determined. They're only allowed to rank five. And Jackie Robinson, Rookie of the Year, they're only allowed to rank three. So if this had been a different race, for example, then uh, Guerrero, Tome, and uh, Gambi wouldn't even be recognized. Uh, so I did what I just showed you there for all 58 elections. I took the ballot results. I applied uh, the 10 different alternate schemes to see the schemes, for, uh, excuse me, the elections from 1990 to 2018, how many times we could have got a different MVP. And so just like Benoit found, in every single election, one of the rankings of the finalists would have been changed. Uh, in 37 elections, the top five would have changed. So somebody in the top five would have bumped up to a higher position. And then in six elections, this is the big part, six elections we could have had a different MVP <clears throat> under one of these reasonable point systems. So every single election, oh, excuse me, every single scheme except for C and D, um, which to remind you, C and D is the one where we decrease um, the gap. So instead of 14, 9, 8, we have 13, 9, 8, and 12, 9, 8. So C and D did not produce major reversals. So if they'd use C or D, then we'd probably, we would still be rewarding first place a lot. So it kind of makes sense that wouldn't matter. But in every other scheme, then the number, then the MVP would have been different. And this is kind of a major result. It's not like I went through and when in every single election it was like, well, if I tweak this number a little bit and tweak that one down and then I can kind of like finagle an MVP. No, this is, every, these multiple schemes could have produced a different MVP. So at this point it's starting to sound like, yes, ability does matter because they have to get high rankings on the ballots, but MVP is also sort of a product of the scheme. And so scheme G is especially an interesting one. It was the one that most likely, most frequently uh, resulted in a reversal. So scheme G is the one where we value uh, second place also very highly, which makes sense to me because you're probably in contention like, ooh, there are some years where there's an obvious winner. There have been uh, unanimous decisions. Like in the past three years or four years, there have been four elections where the number one, the MVP, had at least uh, 27 out of 30 votes. But in some years, it's highly contentious. So it's like, do you really know for sure that this is better? And it, so a scheme G, which values second, is still quite an honor, uh, produced a lot of reversals. So for the rest of my presentation, I'm just going to go through some years that had some interesting results. So uh, this is the 2011 AL election. So Justin Verlander got, was named MVP, won by quite a large margin, 38 vo votes. And um, he got by far the majority of first place votes. This seems logical. But under Scheme G, which again is where we rank second place almost as high as first place, then in Scheme G, Ellsbury would have narrowly beat out Verlander. So why does this matter? So if you look, Verlander has by far the most first place votes, but Ellsbury has the most votes in the top five and in the top two. And in fact, if you add up the points, if you look at the number of votes he got, somebody didn't vote for Verlander. So 13 people thought Verlander was best in the league, and 27 other people thought he was in the top 10, but there was one person who didn't. So is this an example of tanking? It's certainly possible. But if somebody had voted for Verlander at all, if they'd even ranked Verlander 10th in scheme, if Scheme G had been used, and if someone had put Verlander even in 10th place, he would have tied Ellsbury. But because they left him off, if they had used Scheme G, he would not have won. So this goes back to why do they have this five point gap in the first place? Why do they give 14 points to first and nine points to second? And part of the reason is that it helps prevent taking, tanking. So you see under Scheme G where there's not a gap between first and second, one voter can determine whether or not Verlander is the MVP or not. But under the normal scheme, Verlander keeps a huge advantage because he has a lot of first place votes. And by all accounts, Verlander seems like the obvious choice. So keeping a five point premium from first to second place helps prevent uh, strategic voters from manipulating the elections. Table five here, this is the 1999 AL election. And it's really interesting because the one who was named MVP under the official point scheme did not get the most first place votes. So Ivan Rodriguez 
got only seven votes, and Pedro Martinez got eight. So in this case, if they had used a plurality, so if they just said, who's number one, you only get to vote for one person, then Martinez would have won over Rodriguez. And so how does, so this is another example of how the five point gap isn't even, it doesn't guarantee anything. So first place votes are extremely important, but even getting the most first place points don't matter. And you see that if you add up the points again, that Martinez was excluded from two people's ballots. So two people, again, is this tanking? Did they just really think Martinez is overvalued? We can't know the voters' preferences. But if Martinez had been included on those two ballots at, uh, at seventh place or higher, then he, they could have overtaken Rodriguez. And then this is an example. These are people who were not in the top one or two MVPs for 1998, but this is an example of how individual players are impacted every single year by this, even if the MVP wouldn't be swapped. So uh, under, this is the order uh, under the official scheme, but under schemes H, I, and J, we see people flip-flop a lot. So Rodriguez would have beat Clemens in scheme H, but he would have regained it in scheme I, but then he would have lost it again by quite a bit in scheme J. So again, this sort of suggests that the MVP results are as much a product of people's, or excuse me, are as much a product of the point scheme used as they are uh, the actual uh, preferences of the voters. So uh, one thing I mentioned before is that Benoit noticed that from <clears throat> uh, 43 to 89, the number of uh, re reversible MVPs decreased. So from 43 to 67, there were 18 years where the MVP could have changed. But in a even in much bigger period, from 68 to 89, only six of them were reversible. And he thought, he hypothesized that this is because media coverage has increased. So from 40, in 43, there's less communication. There's no you know, national sports networks, anything like that, or sports TV networks. Uh, so people are more likely to have a, uh, less familiarity with all the players. They um, are perhaps more strongly allied toward their team and more likely to vote for their players. But, as, but from 68 to 89, ESPN rises, uh, just general communication increases. So he su suggests that's why it decreases. And I find a similar result. So from 1990 to 2018, uh, I also only find that six um, out of 58 elections have an MVP. So it's still re re reversible, but uh, it's becoming less so. So only one e example in the last 10 years um, could have produced a different MVP. And this is probably true even more so today because now we have, even since 1989, the internet has risen. There's lots of discussion online about things. And in a lot of cases, there's generally a consensus on who should be MVP even before the ballots come out. So today it's less surprising who the MVP is going to be. There are still close races. Last year, um, both the AL and NL in 2019 uh, races, they weren't reversible, but uh, there was strong contention between first and second place. Um, and also another impact is that the people who vote for this are sports writers. So for each city that has a, a major league team, they get to choose two voters, two sports writers to vote. And in the original in the 40s, this started out as newspaper writers, of course, the people who covered the local team. But uh, today, the idea of a sports writer has changed a lot. So uh, in last year's election, for example, Kansas City had no local newspapers represented. So their two voters were from ESPN and Yahoo Sports. So these are much more national voters, smaller uh, city loyalties, perhaps. And so again, in 13 of the last 20 elections, including three unanimous elections, uh, the MVP got more than 80% of first place votes. So it seems that they're becoming less contentious. MVP, the voting still matters, but uh, it's becoming a little more predictable, perhaps. So again, there's no way to define whether what a good or bad or right or wrong system is, and as long as it's nothing perverse, like giving sixth place more points than second place. Um, but the points do matter. So again, six years in the past 30 years, the person who receives the glory of MVP would not have received that. Somebody else would have received it if they had chosen another reasonable point scheme. Um, so MVP voting, again, is probably uh, impacted by media coverage general consensus and to revise before even the voting comes out. And just this is sort of an example of how uh, analysis creators or analytics creators uh, should be conscious of, yes, what are we measuring and how do our numbers matter? How do our processes matter? It sure 
14, 9, 8, it's a good decision, but it's also an impactful decision. Um, yeah, so uh, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues back at Vanderbilt, uh, Dean Andre, Christine Mazel for sponsoring me, and Dr. Waymark and Carolyn Floyd for their support getting me here. And also special thanks to uh, Jean-Pierre Benoit, Bill Dean, and Cassidy Lent for helping me uh, procure the data I needed for this analysis. And of course, thank you for Sabre, to Sabre for having me. <laughs>